Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to an Al Atiyah Foundation activity. Good afternoon. Firstly, some of our readers outside the world of energy will not know too much about the Council and its work. So can you first describe the nature of the Council and what exactly does it do? Yes. So um, the, the, the World Energy Council, we call it WEC in short, uh, was created as early as 1923 by a group of visionary uh, leadership, leader from 40 countries to discuss problems, the problems facing the global energy industry. And since that time, WEC has basically remained as it was originally, that is to say, it's a non-governmental institution. It's a non-profit organization. We are a charity. We are neutral. I will explain later on what it means. And we are global because we cover the totality of the planet in terms of country. And also we cover the totality of the energy sources. Of course, all along those years, we have known many, many changes, uh, many, many geopolitical, economic upheavals. And, and now again, we are, we are facing a, a very deep and complete shift in the way people understand and use energy. So today, the WEC is about 100 countries, 3,000 members, uh, which are business leaders from private and, and state-owned sector, governments or, or officials, inst international institutions, experts from academics. And, uh, and what is common to all of us is that we are members, our members are engaged in decision or, or action. It's a community of doers. And we aim at nurturing the debate with, with our fantastic volumes of experience that our community is representing. We do not talk about what we should do. We, we leave that to others. What we do is that we spend our energies on how to build and transform the old energy system for the benefit of all. And that makes us absolutely unique global, as I said, all energy sources, non-governmental. We are not a lobby organization. We do not advocate for any particular technology. But indeed, we could say we are the voice of the energy community in its globality and its diversity. Second, our statutory mission is to promote the sustainable supply and use of energy for all. That's our mission, according to our statutes. And as such, WAKE is a platform of leaders engaged in the energy who join for exchange experiences, share information, conduct program jointly, and interact and dialogue with decision makers at local or global level. And uh, well, no, what do we do practically? I don't, I would not list all of what we do, but we, are, we have some topical events, I would say, and uh, we have, for example, each and every three years, uh, the, uh, the uh, World Energy Congress, which is the largest gathering of, of experts and, and, and policy ministerials and policy makers, and of course, industrial, industrialists. Uh, last time we were in uh, Abu Dhabi uh, in September last year, and we, we gathered uh, more than 5,000 uh, people, including a lot of min many, many ministers and head of states. But we, we have also smaller events in, in each and every year, and, and we organize different uh, uh, gatherings in different parts of the world. We have publication, some, fla some flagship and regular publication, uh, such our name as the Trilemma monitors, the uh, scenarios, we make some scenarios, we have some specific look at the resilience of the energy system all around the world, and of course we we make specific studies or, or insight on various topics uh, as uh, hydrogen on anything else. And lastly, we have some service for our members, we have uh, 
some program for the future energy leaders to 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 educate uh, our youngsters in our members to and we have an, an internal academy so that's what we are and we have a headquarter which is not a big big thing but very efficient which is based in in, in london present mr chairman when you say that uh, we are doers and uh, we have dialogue with the decision makers do you have really guidelines for decision makers or uh, guidelines for governments to to follow on uh, any energy suggestions you have? Well, uh, well, first of all, yes, we we are interacting with a very large diversity of of, of, of uh, decision makers, including governments governments. Uh, either uh, at, at the global level, for example, we participate to, to some large uh, international gatherings, such as, for example, the Clean Energy uh, Ministerial Summit or other things like that. Uh, but we also deal with energy policy as such. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we, as I said, we do not intend to tell what people have to do. Uh, governments and uh, or, or, or industrialists, they have their own strategy, and, but we try to give them some lights. And for example, one of our regular publication, it's called the Trilema Index, as, as you mm -hmm. as was said. And the Trilema Index is, is an instrument which we publish every year, uh, which looks at the energy policy performance under three main dimension. Then I could say uh, in written brackets for, for, for explaining, we don't think that a policy, energy policy is, is one single objective. It can't be that way. What we have defined as an equilibrated and balanced energy policy uh, is a policy which responds to three main objectives and criteria. Um, the one is the to offer and to supply energy to population in a secure way. So we have the security of supply in many, many instances, not only the big thing, but also um, also access for individual people and so on. So energy security is one very much important thing. Energy equity is also something very important. That is to say, how people can really access to energy. Is it is it at good condition? Is it at affordable price? Is it? And the last uh, element, of course, is uh, environmental sustainability. Sustainability, you say, environment, if you could say. And and we do that uh, regularly based on 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 a on a large global and comparable database overlooking. Uh, 130 uh, countries. This, for example, that's just an example, but this World Energy Trilemma Index aims to enable informed dialogue between stakeholders about how, we, how to improve energy policy and also an instrument to learn from, from each other what is working and what is not working. And in this way, as an example, the trilemma is not meant to be static, but also uh, is meant to help decision maker to design what is their uh, appropriate policy path finding tool. Uh, and of course, also the ability to measure over time what has been working, what has not been working. So that's one of the examples of one of our main um, not the only one, but one of our main publication, which which is intended to give our members some elements to enter into dialogue with their own policy um, uh, regulation in their country, or to discuss between themselves of what the best way to to look at the future. Okay, uh, uh, the the council has long been associated with big energy companies, and this really means fossil fuels. Has the scope of the Council now significantly widened to all other forms of energy, solar and wind, for example? Uh, no, um, you know, I, I think that uh, this is no more a correct vision of what WEC is now, because uh, we have, uh, WEC has always 
a diverse membership across industry, governments, and academic, as I, as I would say. And of course, this composition has evolved with the energy systems. We are, um, as I say, we are technologically neutral. So we do not advocate for any specific fuel types. And so we are open to all. And, and we even more, we think that engaging the diversity in the, in the largest sense of the world, technologically speaking, geographically speaking, and socially speaking, we think that this is the source of strength and, and potential innovation. Um, well, as you, 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 you indicated in a way, the, the energy sector is, is being reshaped by, by a very large and broader drivers than that. And that the council has, has named or termed as the three Ds. Um, uh, the three Ds being the decentralization, the decarbonization, the digitalization, and the demand disruption. It's concept which I think I have no time to to elaborate on, but but it means that we are we are in a in in a in, in a, at a time where the energy systems are increasingly fragmented, mm. with small participants and with customers which have their choice and an increasing power to to influence uh, decisions. And in, in, in our drive to ensure that diversity of the council, we want to look at even more extending uh, our, our, our networks, our community, even above the strict energy players, but also to address um, all the community which have a strong influence on energy. Just to give you an example, we know that the industry not the energy industry, but the other in, in, are also part of the decision makers. And, and we want to enlarge our circles to these new, uh, these new community. So definitely we are not representing any single energy sources. We are looking at energy in a systemic, systemic way. And second, we want even to enlarge our community to influencing the sector or community but that shape the future of energy also. Okay, your website says the energy transition is nothing new. But how do you think the energy transition away from fossil fuels will work? Will the transition be dominated by uh, electricity and fossil, non-fossil fuel generated? Well, um, well first of all, Transition is a word on which we should uh, agree on what does it mean actually. But but energy transition anyway is is a continuous and ongoing process uh, with with of course today a, a, a clear focus on on decarbonization energy system. But it is not only that. Energy transition is is a dramatic evolution which results from a combination of factors which I, I already slightly mentioned, but, but first one is technology. Technology is moving and is changing and is bringing new opportunities. There is also a digital evolution which changed the way the, the societies are organized and can, 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 can work. And of course, there is the impact of the present and the future uh, consequence of climate changes. And this is this combination of, of factors that we call the energy transition. And, you know, it is not uh, an indication of where we go. It's, it's simply indication that there is some, some tectonical, tectonics, I don't know this word exactly, the tectonic uh, moves that, are, uh, that have multiple impacts. And there will be multiple response, not a single one, but the trend is that it is moving faster. And, and there is a question whether the COVID crisis may change the speed of the transition and in, in which direction. We are, we, are, we are looking at that very carefully for the time. But, but it's not very probable that the, these tectonic, tectonic changes will be dramatically impacted by, by COVID. But whatever the transition is, energy demand, will almost double in the developing uh, countries. 
And, and for that reason, all energy forms are likely to be needed. The role of fossil fuel, because you mentioned them, will, will decline but will still account for two thirds of global primary energy demand in, in 2040. And of course, there will be more focus on decarbonization through carbon abatement, circular carbon economy. But, but while, while electricity will be more and more important, will double, if not triple, its, its relative position. But there are various sectors or use which will will and with are and will still continue to be difficult to 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 abat in terms of carbon, um, and it will be difficult to 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 electrify those sectors. I mean, uh, aviation, shipping, or, or some part of industry to one. So um, for those sectors, there will be need to have new approach. Well, today, uh, less than 20% of the global energy comes from electricity. So achieving achieving 100% renewable generation for 40 to 50% of the global energy mix is, and, and in addition, assuming the increased demand simply would be, is a, a massive, massive achievement, not to mention what it means in terms of investment and so on and so on. So, in a natural, even with renewable, uh, and even renewable will will need uh, heat and liquid brands. So, as as I very often say, there is a strong push, of course, to green to green energy. But what is more important is to have greener energy because re renewable energy alone will not be sufficient so so the we don't see uh, so as, as as a conclusion i think oil still is there for long uh, and 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 of course uh, there is uh, ways and technology will have to bring solution to make this oil and, and liquids greener themselves but that doesn't mean that the role of renewables will be marginal in the long run. No, the, the role of, 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 of renewable will not be marginal, will be very significant. And you could say that there is a potentiality that the, the renewable takes a very, very uh, significant share of the electricity production, but alone will not be sufficient. So there is still large room for other sources of energy uh, to be part of the game. But of course, uh, there is a necessity that those other sources of energy also uh, find a way to reduce their, their contribution for, for, for emission. Uh, you know, um, if you look at if you want if we want to bring energy to all people in, in this uh, planet, in a better and safer way. Given the trend, there is no way than to use all energy sources. Mm. But the but but the challenge is to use them in a better way. Okay. What about nuclear in uh, in the transition? Will nuclear be part of the energy transition? Yeah, I, I think nuclear energy will certainly uh, feature in the global energy mix for, for, for decades to come. But, but particularly in those countries with more favorable economics and societal support for including nuclear in their energy system. As you know, it is not the case everywhere. But, but its share, the share of nuclear in the, in the mix and its rate of growth will very much depend on a number of factors. Some of those factors are largely determined by the nuclear sector itself. It is the speed of innovation in new nuclear technology. Um, uh, and, and, and of course, uh, uh, the ability to shape uh, uh, adequate policy on legacy of the waste nuclear management. But many other uh, uh, elements which come from outside uh, the nuclear, in particular the energy policy, 
the market design, because you know, nuclear is such a concentrated and heavy investment that it requires some specific uh, design for favoring investment. And of course, it needs a, a financial structure adapted to that. Uh, but in, in our scenarios, which we uh, gradually update, uh, the last ones, we, we, we produced them at, at the Abu Dhabi conference in September last year. We see that nuclear will, will continue to grow from, let's say, 11% in 2015 to up to, let's say, maybe 13 or 13.5% share of the electricity generation by 2016. So it's not a big, big increase, but we see them as part of the game. Uh, on the long, longer term, uh, what of other technologies? We are hearing a lot about the hydrogen economy. Is there a future for hydrogen perhaps produced cheaply when combined with off-peak electricity? Um, well, of course, we, we, uh, if we want to, to get closer to the objective that uh, the world has given to, 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 to himself, to itself, then we will need a new, new technology. And in particular, the storage of energy will be, of course, a major, major issue, in particular to develop uh, renewable energy, which are interruptible for many of them by nature, and we, and we need to be to cover the, the variability of demand. But, uh, well, we as, 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 as the Council, we have been looking at the potential of, of hydrogen for in the energy uh, transition for, for, for some years from now. Now it has really become a topical issue. You, you, can, you cannot but hear about hydrogen everywhere you go. And, and this is mainly, this interest for hydrogen is mainly because hydrogen offers the potential to decarbonize the use of or energy in sector or in domain which are hard to electrify, uh, but also for potentiality of, of energy storage. So we definitely look at hydrogen as something very promising. And there is a lot of interest for, for using uh, hydrogen for in some sectors of shipping or heavy transport and, and more particularly for the industry. Um, that needs to be uh, decarbonized and that cannot be uh, electrified to a certain degree. But on the other hand, there are still many, many question marks on that. And there are very, very different ways at looking at hydrogen and what are the driver for hydrogen, depending in countries which you are looking at. And many countries indeed are, are just starting considering hydrogen role in their in their future energy transition. So it is a very topical issue. Uh, it is certainly part of the solution, but the way it will develop in the energy transition still be to be seen and, and may be very different from the one country to the other. Uh -huh. What about uh, gas? Is this just a transition fuel well, uh, again, I think there is no there is no single pathway for energy transition, and uh, and and countries will need to determine their own solution based on their different national uh, circumstances. Let's say, but but again, combining the need for supply, a growing demand for energy, with sustainable manner, will require to to use all energy sources for volumes, reasons, but with a greener perspective. And, uh, and achieving the Paris Agreement for a target cannot be thought if we do not consider that we have to green energy and not only, on, and not only look at, at green energy. And, and as such, gas will be part of
Um, I think today it's 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 still a bit of a of a, of a question mark uh, because of course uh, uh, the the future also will very much depend uh, how much we can um, we can make use of 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 carbon storage um, how much can we reduce the carbonization but but. Uh, if you look at, at the gas situation today, you can see very, very different the situation over the world. Europe policy, for example, is very much engaged into the carbonization. Mm. And, and uh, it's, uh, Europe is a large gas uh, uh, users, but the policy is clearly very focused on the carbonization only. Uh, in other parts of the world, let's take of Asia, for example, uh, the gas is growing, and in the particular, the LNG production is is growing, and uh, and um, uh, and and clearly in those regions, gas is part of the solution, uh, not only for CO2 emission reduction, but also for for regional and for local uh, improvement of air quality, as we have seen in China or as we see in India today. So whether how long will be um, that uh, great uh, contribution of gas. I think that's very much, that depends to a certain degree on, on how technology can help us to find uh, more to, to even deeper uh, carbon reduction through carbon capture and, and many other, uh, other ways. Mm -hmm. So very long-term perspective are still uncertain. We've seen that significant carbon dioxide uh, emissions just come from a few countries and industry. What would you say to these countries? No, I think, um, well, no, I think, f first of all, uh, climate change represents uh, an exi existential threat for humanity, for the planet and the livelihoods where we all need to act. So I think, um, uh, I think it, it, the time when when uh, this reality would could be discussed or denied is is largely past now. If I was I was um, I was very much impressed by uh, um, during our last uh, very large um, uh, congress uh, in September, where we have thousands of experts and and policymakers discussing. There is no, nearly no country any longer that deny that that we are challenging a, a very, very serious uh, things. Um, uh, so, um, but uh, on the other end, we know that uh, uh, that combat, uh, fighting for climate change is, is cannot cannot be achieved without um, a strong and active cooperation between uh, the various countries and and you could say we are living at a moment where it seems that international cooperation becomes more difficult um, international institution doesn't work as good as they used to be but on the other end um, we as was illustrated by this pandemic there is also for cooperation and and i have to say one of the reasons of existence of WEC is particularly this, to create platforms and, and locations where people can continue to cooperate and, and, and exchange. Um, the second thing is the debate, uh, as I said, uh, whether it is still a problem or rich or non-rich, the problem is that it is a problem for all. Uh, and and it's why we need more cooperation. The other element I would like to to stress is also that this transition, energy transition, as we have called it, will not be an easy way. There will it may be very tough transition, imp implicating very difficult economic situation for developing countries, but also. Uh, that may even increase inequality, and 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 if we want that this transition is is navigated in in a smooth and as as smooth as possible way, 
there is a very, very strong need to cooperate and to exchange technology and to bring solution. So I think it's to answer your question in a way, it's it's much more larger than simply the rich and the poor. So the question is how the organized to find global solution and to have technology moving at a sufficient rate and pace so that everyone can benefit. And uh, yeah, but the problem, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, uh, one can see that okay. Uh, climate change is not being challenged, uh, that's true. But the problem is that poor countries are not able to implement uh, policies to get to the, this climate change. So what do you do with this, you know? Yes, uh, you know, I, I don't know other practical solution that to continuing our efforts to push for more cooperation to push for, for distribution of technology. And frankly, as, as I told you, we looked at, at energy policy worldwide and things have improved along the last 10 years. Definitely not at the pace we need. And we, we all know that uh, uh, our ambition for climate, for example, are, are, are extremely, extremely ambitious. And we are not on the track. But if you look at, for example, energy accessibility, uh, the fact to, to bringing electricity to people who do not have commercial electricity, or, or we are making some, we are not we, but the world is, has improved this situation. But again, in this fragmented world, we need to use all the way of cooperation, and we, 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 we have to. So I, I accept that you say it's not enough, but but it's not a reason not to continue to act. And and we we for us as WEC, we, we definitely want to 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 offer possibility to continuing dialogue and cooperation between the various companies in various situation and various countries. Do you think that the U.S. administration? The Trump administration has delayed a lot uh, this cooperation by withdrawing from the climate change agreement of Paris. Well, things will say in in longer run. Uh, it's it's uh, it's it's clear that the fact to withdraw from uh, from the Paris Agreement has not been uh, helpful in the sense of of uh, promoting cooperation between countries. But uh, we have to say in the longer run, no, it's not. Uh, it's not. I think. I think. Yeah, there is something also important in this, in some element of this energy transition, is that the role of consumers and the role of public opinion is growing dramatically. You you cannot imagine how younger generation do not necessarily think the same way as as the elder generation was. There is there is social to profound social changes and these sometimes are more impactful than than many other things so it's it's a very very complex ecosystem if you could say of of uh, policy of, of 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 people desire and what technology offers and of course what the financial capacity to respond can do so it's a long 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 story you know i think that energy transition as we call it is simply a bit of a change of civilization. So it will not be done in a day. It's it's a very long trend. So mm -hmm. certain heavy industries are very large uh, emitters of carbon dioxide. Steel, concrete, aluminium are certainly large emitters. But the path to reduce emissions in these industries appears difficult. What can be done about heavy industry? Well, as I said, there are areas where it's going to be very difficult to electrify um, or decarbonize. Uh, solutions are, are, are emerging, so I won't, I won't list them, but, but uh, look at the aluminium manufacturers, for example, which uh, are located in very often in countries which have clean energy systems, such as, I don't know, Iceland, Norway, New Zealand, and Ottawa. And, and uh, 
and and you know they are now no no one can simply forget about the problem can let that aside and uh, very heavy emitters know and, and and will need more and more to explore other solutions such again as carbon capture uh, storage or hydrogen as we mentioned before uh, and that of course uh, we need a number of support, a number of governmental intervention, and, and possibly, uh, uh, possibly the, the carbon pricing will be part of the solutions. But, but I think again, uh, when you discuss and meet with with those industrial uh, users of energy, which 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 then we, you you realize that they understand that. For their future of their system, their own sustainability, they, they need to respond to the development of societies and to bring solution and, and technology can, can can do something for that. Uh, Mr. Doge, do you believe the world can save itself from a climate change disaster? Will technology and political will win through in the end before 2050? <laughs> Uh, you could say I'm, I'm an optimistic by nature. <laughs> uh, and uh, I know that we are lagging far behind the rate at which we should be, according to what we, we I say we collectively have decided to go. But, but I'm, still, uh, I'm still optimistic, both from the political and the technology perspective. Um, from the political point of view, I think you can see, as I mentioned, you can see a growing number of countries, of stakeholders, companies, and so on, that commit themselves to the, this net zero carbon target. Um, on the technical, technical choice, uh, technical uh, solution on its side, you have the declining cost of renewable, which is extremely, extremely impressive which makes them ever more competitive in some cases than and can be deployed much faster and more cheaply than some of, of the new fossil fuel plants, fuel plants for example. And, um, and there are new storage solutions that are emerging and that can address the intermittency issue. So, so I think, I think we, we, we can be optimistic if we believe, and I do believe, that technology will be part of the solution and can bring solution. In a way, success will come from what? It will come from technology. It will come from options, of course, to decarbonize the mix, or more decarbonize the mix, and also to, to saving and, and better efficiency. I'm not, I, I want to refuse in a way, I want to refuse to give to to consider as a given that we have chance to be in a better future, or to to not to or to renounce to bring welfare to to the humanity and to bring sustainable and safe solution. So I think I'm in top optimistic in the sense that I think we have solutions or potential solutions. Whether that will be easy, it's 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 another matter. I uh, to be optimistic and 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 to to find smooth solution for for this evolution. I think more more fundamentally that we need to return bigger picture of the energy story. I mean, bigger picture than that focus only to the race to a zero carbon narrative. I think the energy story is is much more la larger than that. Mm -hmm. And and for example, I think that if we want to have a success in this transition, if we want to limit the the negative impact of this transition on on people and, and the poorest of them, for example, um, we need also to have vision on how we can make it also better for for human being, as it is individual or or, or larger. 
And I think, um, I think the, how the, the individual customer reacts, what is the consequence for, for people, are if we don't look at that, then people will not accept. And, 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 and they will not accept the consequence, and then the future will be even darker. So it's why, uh, as WEC, we have taken the decision to, to give a certain orientation, part of the orientation, to improve the, the vision on what we call it as a slogan, in a way, on how to humanizing the energy transition and how to anticipate what is the, the uh, response to give to, to, to people, to help them to better understand and to see how, how the future can look like and what's, what's the change they, they need to do. You, you need now to understand what is the customer behavior, what is their expectation. And if you don't understand that, then I think there's no policy that will, that will work. And again, I think for that very reason, it's only by working together, that is to say, engaging more diversity and, and to consider that more diversity is a strength that we can hope to navigate through uh, this global transition and, 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 and pull the uh, energy society to the best way to reduce the shock and the risk that the energy transition may bring to us. Will we ever see a unified carbon tax? Well, uh, difficult question. The individual countries are, are, are exploring this option. Uh, I would say with uh, increased support from the industry, uh, including for, for part of the oil industry itself. Uh, and, and support as, as an economically effective solution to ensure what we say we call a global level playing field, which, which uh, many, many of them think better than, than strictly political approach or problems. So, um, or regulation, not political, regulatory issues. So I think there is a growing support for that, but, but still significant challenges that remains and and to be frank uh, are m much more difficult to coordinate at the global level so i suspect solutions will emerge but i think they will most likely emerge regionally at first at least so as a as a, as a plausible solution uh, that could evolve with greater coordination and i remain relatively positive but again if you don't embark, uh, as I say, the impact of that on, on people in their practical life, uh, then I think it's difficult, as we have seen uh, last year, with some difficult uh, social movement resulting from, from this. So, uh, yes, certainly a solution, but, but we are still far from uh, uh, a global and unified solution for that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Doge. It was really a pleasure and an interesting insight that uh, you gave us. And thank you for, for your time. We look forward to hearing from you again in future interviews.